Good morning. Good morning. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord once again. Uh, I'm Reverend Lord Jim Robinson. I will be conducting our Sunday school overview on this morning. Our Sunday school overview, uh, our date is February 12, 2023. Uh, we're in our winter quarter. Uh, our devotional reading is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 14. Our background scripture and our print passage is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verses, verses 3 and 14. But now, uh, our author, the gentleman who did this particular Sunday school lesson, he starts at verse 3. But for us to really get a clear understanding of what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us on today, uh, we're going to have to uh, dive into verses 1 and 2 as well. Amen. Uh, let us open up with the word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, for another glorious day, Father. Amen. We ask you, Father, Lord, to Help us, Lord, understand your spoken word a lot better, Father God. Mm -hmm. Father, continue, your Lord, to allow us to be better, Lord, than we were on yesterday, Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for traveling grace, Father. Amen. Bless those who are more graceful on their way, Father. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Amen. Now, uh, we, we, we see this particular letter. Uh, this is a pastoral epistle. Uh, our author is the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's writing his letter to one of his sons in the ministry, his beloved, faithful son, uh, Timothy. Okay. Now, uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, uh, what the whole theme of chapter 1 is, he's telling Timothy to hold on to it. Okay. okay? Uh, chapter 2, he's telling Timothy to teach it. Uh -huh. Chapter 3, he's telling Timothy to abide in it, remain, stay with it. And then in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, he's telling him to preach it. But... If you look at uh, verse 1 in 2 Timothy of chapter 1, uh, will someone please read that? Chapter, chapter 1, verse 1 in 2 Timothy. Okay, thank you. Now, you notice how Paul, he starts out with a greeting and an introduction to Timothy. But if you go back to 2, uh, if you go back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul has this same greeting. And, and you may be saying, why is Paul doing this again in 2 Timothy when Timothy already knows who Paul is? Well, back then, there was a lot of persecution that was taking place. And, and, and also, uh, will someone go to chapter 4 for me in 2 Timothy? Go to chapter 4 for a minute. And this is also going to help us understand why Paul makes his greeting an intro to his son in the ministry, Timothy. Chapter 4, someone read verse 10 and someone read verse 14 in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 10 and verse 14, please. For Demas had forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, preaching to Galatia, Titus, and to Dalmatia. Okay, now someone read verse 14, please. Okay, thank you. Now, Paul, he reintroduces himself to Timothy. Now, verses 1 through 5, Paul is motivating. He's encouraging his son in the ministry. Now, the reason why I had you all to read those two verses is because there were a lot of people who started out with the Apostle Paul, then they abandoned the Apostle Paul. And Paul, what he does, he, he, he tells Timothy, he wants to remind Timothy of his journey. Come on, man. Okay, he, he, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you know about my conversion on the road to Damascus, but not only did you know about my conversion, you know that that was my calling too. And he said that, he said, this is by the will of God. In other words, he says, I was drafted to be an apostle. Mm -hmm. He said, it wasn't my choice. Mm -hmm. He said, God chose me before I was even born to be his apostle. And then, and, and, and then he goes on to say, this is, this is what I really, really love about it because Paul was getting ready to be executed. He was imprisoned by Nero. He was getting ready to be executed. And Paul has never did an intro like this. He says, according to the promise of life. Now, in other words, he's getting ready to be executed, but he knows he's going to have life after his execution. And, and he said, even though I, I'm, I'm about to be killed, my head is about to be chopped off, but there's already been a promise by Jesus that I'm going to spend eternity with him. And he says, when you have Christ, 
That's a promise of life with Christ forever. Then he goes on in verse 2. Look, look at verse 2. This is what I love. He says to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. And see, what, 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 what he does here, Paul is speaking with authority now to his son. Right. He's speaking from a father-son relationship right now. This is the type of conversation he's having with Timothy. He's speaking from an apostolic authority to his own son in faith. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul understood that Timothy, just like every believer, had been saved by grace, mercy, and we have peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then what he's doing, he's telling Timothy, don't forget about this grace and this mercy and the peace that God has given you. Now, every day when we wake up, God gives us new grace. He gives us new mercy. And y'all, I thank God for his grace and his mercy. But the key factor is he gives us peace too. When, when, when there's a lot of confusion going on around us, God gives us peace to where it doesn't even bother us or fade us. But look at verse 3. Now, one thing that we have to remember, my brothers and sisters, if we really want to truly motivate other believers, other brothers and sisters in Christ, right. just like Paul is motivating Timothy, right. we, must, we must do this from a place of genuineness. Right. You know, we, 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 we really need to do this with love and compassion. Right. So they can be truly blessed. Right. Now, I don't know about you all, but everybody needs motivation. Right. You know, time your man sings, sings a song, sometimes you have to encourage yourself, but there's going to be some days when you can't encourage yourself, if I can just keep it real. Right. There's going to be some days when you're going to be down, and, 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 and you know, you're going to need someone to lift you up. Come on. One of the things I love that my wife says, and, and, and she said this, uh, sometimes we're watching the news together, and she'll say, you know what, our John? She said, it's sad that the world and even the church, uh, we crucify each other. Come on. She said, when, when, when a person is down, we stay to crucify them to keep them down. And, 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 and y'all know what a crucifixion is. That means you're nailing someone down. You, 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 you're keeping them down. And, and, and you know, that's not motivation. Uh, we, we're here to motivate and lift each other up. Right. So look at what verse, verse verse 3 says. Look at what verse 3 says. Paul goes on, he says, I thank God. Yes, sir. Whom I serve, as my ancestor did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Now, what Paul is, is, is telling Timothy right here, he's saying, Timothy, not only was you a blessing, not only was I a blessing to you. But you are a blessing to me. Yeah, right. Now we see the Apostle Paul now. Now you got to understand the scene that Paul is in. Paul is not in the sanctuary like we're in right now. Paul is not in his living room. Paul is not even in the office at the church. Paul is in a cold dungeon, locked up. And here it is. He's writing his son in the ministry, motivating him. <laughs> he, he, he tells Timothy, he said, I know you appreciate me. But I want you to know that I appreciate you also. Yeah. Now, these two men, they traveled together. They ate together. They ministered together. And they suffered together. Paul was telling Timothy how much he appreciated him. And, and, and if I can use my imagination when Timothy read this letter, this really motivated Timothy. It, it, it made him to want to go on a little further. Now, we have to understand Timothy is a pastor of a church in Ephesus. All right. Paul pastored his church for three years. Then he turned it over to his son in the ministry, Timothy. Come on, man. Now, Timothy was having some problems at the church. Yeah. Uh, he was a young pastor in his 30s. When Apostle Paul wrote this, he was in his 60s, and Timothy is in his 30s. There were some things that was taking place in the congregation, and Timothy had became discouraged. Timothy was so discouraged, and, and, and one while, when Paul had left Corinth, he had sent Timothy to Corinth, and the church at Corinth had made Timothy so discouraged he left, and Paul had to send Titus to go do what Timothy was supposed to do. Come on, God. So Timothy was timid. Come on, son. He was hey. easy to rally. Come on, son. Hey. He, he, he was, uh, you know, he was young, and, 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 and we know if we can just be honest about it, uh, some people try to take advantage of young people. Right. Some people try to take advantage of pastors. 
Some people try to take advantage of leaders. That's why we all need motivation and encouragement. All right. But look at what Paul says, though. He says, look at this statement. He says, whom I serve. Now, this word right here, whom I serve, is in the present tense. Okay? No one retires from serving God. See, when you work for God, God don't have an S&P 500. He don't have a NASDAQ or, or an Amex. Uh, he doesn't have a retirement plan. So you don't retire from serving God. You don't retire from fellowshipping with God. You don't retire from paying your tithes. You don't retire from praying to God. You retire when you clock out of this world. Come on, yeah. Now, when we talk about serve, the word serve is an act of worship. And Paul was about to die. Yeah. But, he, but he's still telling Timothy. He's telling Timothy, do not drop out. Hang in there, son. You can do it. Keep going. And so I want to encourage all of you all here today. Even those who are watching on Facebook right now. Keep going. Yes, sir. Yeah, come on. You can do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. It don't matter if you have a sixth grade education. It don't matter if you got your GED. It don't matter if you have a associate's degree. A bachelor of arts, a doctor degree, keep going. Do not drop out of the Christian race. Yes, and, and, and another thing that I like about Paul, Paul was telling Timothy, he said, eternity is just ahead. Then we can get some rest. <laughs> he said, but while you're here, son, keep working. Yes, sir. Keep working. Yeah. But when you cross over, then is when you can get your rest. Uh -huh. Moving on to, to, to verse 4. He says also, he says, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm still in verse 3. He says that whom I serve, but look at this, Paul was about to die, and he says, now, not only, I'm not going to be the only man dying for this faith. Come on, man. He said, there were some men before me yeah. who died for the faith. Yeah. But who's those men? Yeah. Abraham, <laughs> Isaac, yeah. Jacob, yeah. Moses, Elijah. And the list goes on and on. But, but, but Paul says, I'm in the same category that they are. We died for the faith. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, he says that I'm doing what the ancestors did, but he says I'm doing this with a clear conscience. Yeah. <laughs> How many of y'all have, have ever did someone wrong? Ooh. And you couldn't rest with it. Your conscience beat you up. Yeah. Nobody had to say nothing to you. Your conscience was whooping you itself. But Paul says clear conscience. But what, what, what is he talking about? The word clear means clean. In, in other words, his sins had been forgiven by God. Everything that Paul had done, you must remember, Paul was persecuting the church. Yeah. Paul was turning Christians over and putting them in prison. Yeah. But he had got that straight with God because he made, he made, uh, he asked God to forgive him, and that made his conscience. Clear. Come on, yeah. And then what Paul says, he said, when you have a clear conscience, that means God knows your heart. Yeah, yeah. But then he goes on to tell his son in the ministry, Timothy, he said, not only do I have a clear conscience, son, he said, but I'm praying for you night and day. He said, there's not a day that goes by, there's not a night that doesn't go by, that I'm not praying for you. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, we all need Paul. <laughs> and we all need a Timothy. Yeah, yeah. All of us need someone who's going to mentor us in this walk. And we all need to be mentoring someone in this walk. Yeah. All of us need a Paul, and, we, and all of us need a Timothy. Yeah. Because we all, don't, all of us don't know it all. Right. Right. But we can share what we do know with someone. And if we do know more than others, why don't you pour into that person? Mm -hmm. Boy. Verse 4. Someone read verse 4 for us, please. Recall in your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Thank you. Now what he is saying here also, Paul missed Timothy's companionship. Uh -huh. and, and, and he was eagerly to hopefully see his son in the ministry again. Paul recalled the tears from Timothy the last time they had saw each other in Ephesus. And seeing Timothy again will really bring joy to Timothy and Paul. But look at what he says in verse 5. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, right. which first lived in your grandmother Lois right. and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded 
now lives in you also. He remembers Timothy's faith. Okay? And, 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 and what Paul is saying is, he's saying, Timothy, your faith was on your recruit. All right? In, in other words, he's saying, Timothy, your faith is the real thing. You're not walking around with the fake faith. Your faith is sincere. It's real. What you see is what you get. All right. And see, and, and, but what he said, this kind of faith was first in your grandmother Lois. Mm -hmm. Then it was in your mother Eunice. Now Paul, along with Barnabas, had met these two women on his first missionary journey. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and, and now Paul had won both of them over to Christ. All right? Yeah. And, and their genuine faith had found its way into the life of young Timothy. Come on, My brothers and sisters, our kids are watching us. Our grandkids are watching us. Our nieces, our nephews, they're watching us. Even the youth in the church, they're watching us. Now, what I want y'all to understand is the grandmother and the mother, they taught Timothy the scriptures. And my brothers and sisters, we have to, in our very households, we got to open up the word of God with our family. Come on, man. <laughs> so I want to ask y'all a question. When was the last time you opened up the scriptures with your family in the house? When was the last time you said, well, I know we eat together, we talk together, but let's go over the word together. Yeah. Why don't everybody sit at the table? Let's open up the Sunday school book. Come on, man. Let's open up the Bible. Yeah. Let's discuss the word of God <laughs> together. Yeah. Now, the thing I like about this, I like to call this type of faith a migrating faith. And the reason why I say this is because their faith had taken up residence in them. Okay? It didn't come on a visit. All right? But it came to stay on them permanently. And then it had also taken up residence in Timothy without leaving his grandmother or his mother. Now, the things I love about it is now, the grandmother and the mother had faith, but it was still up to Timothy to decide if he wanted to have this sincere faith. They, they couldn't persuade the faith on him, but it was their lifestyle that persuaded him that I'm going to have this type of faith my grandmother and my mother has. All right. So I want to ask you all two questions right now. What kind of impact is your faith having on <coughs> this next generation? My Lord. My Lord. See, your faith will either have a positive or negative impact. Amen. See, when your faith rises, your fear will fall. Mm -hmm. yeah. When your faith is 100%, your fear will be 0%. Question number two. What kind of faith are you passing on? Because whether you know it or not, you're passing on some kind of faith. It's either you're passing on a positive faith or you're passing on a negative faith. You know, two, two weeks ago, me and Ty, we had one on a visit to Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas. And this really touched my heart. And uh, I've been joyful and thanking God ever since because this really let me know that he's been paying attention to what me and my wife has instilled in him. When we made it down there, everything was good. The ride was good. But on the way back, when we made it to Mineral Wells, Texas, it was by right, right, right by Rutherford, Texas. Right. On our way back, we was looking out the five in the evening. And we was coaching in, we was ready to come home, and we was on the phone with my wife and my mother-in-law, and we was all laughing with each other. You know, they said, we can't wait to see you all. We glad everything went so good. Even the coaches were calling. You know, we glad you all came down here. We hope that Ty signed with us. But then something happened five minutes later. Hmm. Ty gets the thing on his GPS. He says, oh, John, we got to, we got to edge it off. I said, well, son, we, we, we can't exit out because there's ice on the service road. There was cars that were stuck on the service road for about one or two miles. But then we found ourselves, we were stuck <laughs> on the train east for seven and a half hours, y'all. <laughs> we were stuck on 20 east now, coming, coming, coming back to Dallas for seven and a half miles. And, 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 and the thing about it that I love about it is I was on half a tank. And, 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 and the traffic was a standstill. We, we, we were stuck on 20 East. And, and, and as I looked at Ty, 
He was getting cold because it was 23 degrees outside. So I had to turn the car on and off so we could keep warm. And so I looked at him. I said, son, I said, are you okay? He said, yes. I said, are you sure? I said, you're not worried. He said, no. He said, I have faith in God that he's going to bring us home. <laughs> y'all, that's it. Now, now y'all, we, we talking about a 17-year-old now. I don't know about you all, but, but, but y'all should have been clapping about that. Because we, we talking about a 17-year-old who told his father, I have faith that God is going to bring us home. Now, we're on two days now for seven and a half hours. <laughs> we're about to run out of gas. But well, one particular time, y'all, uh, we, we woke up at about 12.47 in the morning. Come on, man. And Ty said, oh, Jim, there were some cars going on the grass. <coughs> so I started driving on the grass. And as we went through all those 18 wheelers, our next exit was a QT. Come on, son. <laughs> <laughs> so we stopped at QT, got us something to eat, got some water, filled up, and God brought, brought us home back to the house. Oh, y'all, see, when you have faith like that, See, when your kids see you trusting, Come on, saying, God, I trust you. Come on, when your kids see you say, Lord, we put them in your hands, whatever you do. Y'all, it's going to rub off on them. So that's the kind of faith that we all need to have. But look at, but look at what he's saying also. Paul, Paul, this persuaded him. This persuaded Paul. This made Paul feel good because he knew the kind of faith that the grandmother and the mother had. Yeah. He was persuaded. This made him feel good because he knew the kind of faith that his son Timothy had. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on in verse 6. He says, For this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. Yeah. Was... He says, Which is in you through the hand <laughs> of my hands. Well, Paul is saying, You can speak, son. Ooh. I've heard you speak. Ooh. You can talk. You do a good job. What did you say? He said, use it for Jesus. He said, when you speaking, you teaching, you preaching, you're using this for Jesus Christ. Amazing. But he says, he says, he reminds Timothy to keep it burning. He said, don't, don't, don't put it out. Don't allow no one to put your fire out. Right. He said, right. keep it burning. It's in you. He said, I've watched you. I've mentored you. I've ministered you to you. I've heard you. Use the gift God has blessed you with, son. Right. He said, don't sit on it. Yeah. Don't put it out. Hmm. Come on now. It's needed and it's useful. Right. It's in you because something happened. Right. He said, I know it's in you because something happened. Something happened because I laid hands on you. Come on. I bless you, son. And, and the word of laying hands, that means ordained. Paul ordained Timothy. Come on, he laid his hands on him. He blessed him because he knew that Timothy was going to was going to need this further up the road. Verse seven. Someone read verse seven for us, please. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self discipline. Thank you. Now. Paul is also encouraging Timothy. He's reminding Timothy that God has not given you the spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. Timothy's name means timid. He, he, he was timid. Uh, he was kind of shy. Uh, didn't, didn't really, he, he didn't really like a lot of uh, altercations. Uh, you know, he, he was young, still learning. But he says God already has provided for us the right resources. Hmm. Look at this. He said, you don't have to be afraid because God has already given us the right resources. Amen. What are those resources? He reminds Timothy and us of our possessions in Christ. Y'all see that? He says, our resources from God are power, love, and sound mind. All right? Now, that word power means dunamis, dynamite. Come on now. All right? It's, it's a great force of energy. All right, and God gives power to be effective for his service. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on to say the next one is love. And this love he's talking about is agape, the unconditional love. Right. 
Love that desires and work for the best interest of the one who needs to be loved. Right. Then he says, sound mind. That means you have to be disciplined. Okay, you got to have self-control. You got to use good judgment. You have to make good decisions. And God allows us to maintain ourselves in this world. Now, the thing you got to understand is, when we make sound decisions, when we are under self-control and when we're disciplined, this has to come from the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Yeah. We have to be careful of not making our own decisions, especially when it comes to God's church. We have to make sure that we're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Now, there's one thing that I wanted, wanted to remind us right quick in verse 6. I want to re rewind back to verse 6 right? we're talking about this, this uh, fan into flame. Okay. Now, us as a church, okay, we need stirring up because these are stirring times. Okay? These are some stirring times that we're in, my brothers and sisters. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Uh, so, so, so we need to remember that we need to keep stirring up too. And the church must stay alive. Right. Okay? Amen. We, we, we must stay alive. We can't let people come in and just pour our fire out. <laughs> we just can't let people come in and, and, and try to keep the word of God from, from going forward like it needs to be doing. Yeah. So, brothers and sisters, we need to keep stirring. I just wanted, wanted to add that. Someone read verse 8 for us. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord as of me as Christian. Rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Thank you. Now right here, verses 8 through 14, Paul is reminding to and encouraging him to not to be ashamed. You don't have nothing to be ashamed of. And because Paul is telling him this because he knew that Timothy would continue to face difficulty. He knew that some things were going to continue to come at him. People were going to come at him to try to knock him down. People were going to try to come at him to discourage him. He's telling him, do not be ashamed. Now, there are three things that Timothy should not be ashamed of with what Paul is telling him. And see, Timothy had faced a hostile environment. Back in Rome, people were being persecuted. If you were a Christian, Nero were putting you in jail, he was killing you. So Timothy was facing hostile environment. See, some people wouldn't even receive his message in the church. There were some individuals that came in that, 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 was, that, that was trying to down talk what he was preaching and teaching. Some even ridiculed his faith. Some even tried to test him. They tried to challenge him. But he tells Timothy not to be ashamed of your Savior. He says, do not be ashamed to identify yourself with the cross of Jesus. Right. See, it's the cross that stands as the divided line between saint and sinner. It's the cross that purchases us salvation, y'all. Then number two, he says, do not be ashamed of the people of God. He said, Paul says, don't be ashamed of me. He says, because I'm in prison, but I'm in prison for Christ. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, do not be ashamed of those who are serving the Lord. Right. See, some may be strange to us. Some may even act weird. Some may stutter. Some may be on food stamps, might be on section eight. But guess what? They still right. part of the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. So don't be ashamed of a brother or sister who's in the body of Christ who may be less fortunate than you. Don't be ashamed of a brother or sister in Christ who may have been put in prison. Because see, just because they're put in prison doesn't mean that they did anything. Come on, come on, then number three, he says, do not be ashamed of God's plan. Mm -hmm. He said, do not be ashamed to identify yourself with the gospel message. Mm -hmm. He says, sometimes when you preach the truth, uh -huh. it may bring some division. Come on. Because everybody might not want to hear the truth. What? He right. says, it's going to bring some affliction. He said it's going to bring some persecution. Yeah. But this gospel message is what penetrated your heart, Timothy. That's he right. said, so don't be ashamed because you know the gospel is the truth and it's the word of God. Yeah. He, said, he said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Mm -hmm. And see, the gospel draws people to Christ. Amen. We don't draw people to Christ, my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. It's the gospel through the work of the Holy Spirit that draws a man or woman down to say, what must I do to be saved? Someone go to a Matthew chapter 7. Someone go to Matthew chapter 7 and read verses 22 and 23. Matthew chapter 7, 
verses 22 and 23. Would someone else so kind and read that for us, please? Oh, okay. Chapter 7. Verse 
And the police officer follow the police officer and the officer. Okay, thank you. Now, he, he goes on to tell Timothy that the positions we have in God's kingdom work are not for our own choosing. You remember what I said in verse 1? That God drafted him to be an apostle. God chose him to be an apostle. And, and, and what Paul is saying here, he's saying that I am appointed a preacher. Now, this word appointed is in the passive voice. In other words, God, God chose Paul to be a preacher. Okay? And a preacher is one who delivers the message about Jesus. He tells others about the glory of God. But not only that, he appointed Paul to be an apostle. It's one who sent out from the orders on behalf of Jesus Christ. Then he chose Paul to teach. It's one who shows people the way of salvation. He tells individuals how to come to know Jesus. Now, this is the blessed part about this. Some people say, well, how can he choose Paul as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher? That's because that's what God wanted to do. <laughs> Once again, Paul didn't choose to be none of these. God chose Paul to be this. And, 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 what, and, 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 and whenever you're called to preach, that means you're called to teach too. Because a preacher is a teacher. Yeah. Now, when we're going to talk about the, an apostle, apostle is someone who saw Jesus. Paul met Jesus on that Damascus road. He saw Jesus because it was Christ who knocked him off of that horse. Yeah. And Paul was blinded for three days. So this is why Paul is classified as an apostle because he actually saw Jesus firsthand. Now, we got to understand this, my brothers and sisters. God chooses when, he chooses where, and how we are to serve him. Okay? Our job is to, to be available. Our job is to yield. Our job is to be useful. And our job is to be faithful. That's why we have to be careful when we say God can't use on anybody. <laughs> because God can use anybody. See God, see, see, God doesn't look at things the way we look at them. That's why he said, my ways are not like your ways. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Don't you know God can take a homeless person, clean him up, stand him up, and bring him here to pastor his church? <laughs> that, 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 that's how awesome God is. And see, God does the choosing. See, we need to get out of the way and let him do his job. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, this is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. See, Paul was in prison because he was faithful to God. How many of you all right now can actually say you're going to sit in the jail cell right now for God? Uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but am I by myself? <laughs> I mean, I mean, how many of y'all can say you actually go sit in a cold, damp, wet prison jail cell at the bottom just for serving Jesus Christ? You got to think about it. Paul is in a wet dungeon. When it's cold, it's cold down there. When it's hot, it's hot down there. And still, this man still picks up a pen and writes to Timothy to encourage Timothy. And if anybody needed encouragement, if somebody was going to be discouraged, it was the Apostle Paul, y'all. See, some of y'all may have never been into a jail cell. Some of y'all may have visited someone in a jail cell. Y'all, that's not a good feeling. <laughs> because you're confined in an area where you have limited access. See, when you serve God, we got to understand, you will be tested. See, you don't have a powerful testimony until you pass the test. The test is what allows you to stand up and thank God and tell the people of God about how he brought you through that powerful testimony. We're going to be tried. We're going to be afflicted. And when we go through our test, trials and affliction, it's the pressure that God uses to mold us into his image. Y'all see what God is doing. We go through things in life where people come at us or Satan is trying to attack us. It's the molding that God is trying to do. See, 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 God puts us in a position too where he can mold us, where he can pressure us. You remember the potter and the clay? Uh -huh. See, to mold a clay, the potter has to exert pressures on the clay. 
See, the clay is formed into a shape that pleases him. <laughs> See, sometimes, my brothers, the molding is painful sometimes. <laughs> but God has to mold us, y'all. It's, it's, it's painful sometimes. Sometimes he got to sit us down. Sometimes he got to put us on our back. Sometimes he got to make us hit rock bottom. But, but during those situations, he's molding us. He's shaping us to be who he want us to be. And see, this is the process of molding so we can be a vessel of his arm. Now, I, I don't know about you all, but I remember the late uh, Pastor C.B.T. Smith. He preached here. I wasn't even going here yet, but I would come here sometimes to hear him preach because I liked the way he preached. I never shall forget, he said, God, I just want to be a trophy for you. <laughs> we, <laughs> y'all, we talk about a trophy now. <laughs> and guess what? That trophy had to be molded. That trophy didn't look like that in the beginning. It's the finished product from that trophy. But Paul tells us that he is persuaded. Y'all see that word? He said he's persuaded. It means he has been tranquilized. Now, it carries the idea of being able to rest in total assurance that all is well. Paul says, I'm in the dungeon, y'all. I'm locked up. He said, but all is well. He said, I'm getting ready to be persecuted. My head is about to be cut off, but all is well. He said, he said, it's well because my soul is calm. My soul is at peace, y'all. My soul has joy because I know where I'm about to go. See, Paul is confident in that the Lord is able. See, he knows that God is mighty, powerful, and strong. See, Paul says God will keep. See, he knows God will keep an eye on him. God has kept an eye on him all his life. Even when he was persecuting the church, God still had a plan for him. And he said, not only is he keeping me, but he's guarding me. And my brothers and sisters, y'all can get some sleep at night. <laughs> don't have folks keep you up, keep you up late at night worrying. You know, don't, don't, don't get caught up in people gossiping and all that. Lay down and get you some rest so you can serve God properly. Because see, when people put a bad spirit in you, God can't use you like he really want to use you, y'all. <laughs> So, 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 so get you some sleep and get you some rest. But what Paul says is, he guards me, he keeps me because he's made a deposit. <laughs> Come on, you know, every Monday, you know, uh, I'm thankful I get to go to the bank and I get to make a few deposits. But that's not the kind of deposit that Paul is talking about. Help us, man. This is an eternal deposit. This is a deposit in him to where he can bless the people of God. Then when it's time for him to move on, he can go get him some rest. See, Paul had given his whole life to Christ. And what I love about Paul, Paul had committed his soul. He had committed his services. He had committed his sacrifices to Jesus Christ. Right. Now, I want to ask you all another question. Because a lot of times, if, if we really be honest, we don't really want to sacrifice. <laughs> but, I get, but I want to tell you something. I, the brothers, used to sing a song. Nothing but smooth sailing. See, in this lifestyle, there's not going to be no smooth sailing every day. There's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some sacrifices. But guess what? We got to keep pressing on. So I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 and then we'll close. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. God is with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Thank you. Now, you see something. He says, if you notice, he says, hold fast. Now, remember I said chapter 1, he tells Timothy to hold on to it. Right. Chapter 2, he tells Timothy to teach it. Right. Chapter 3, he tells Timothy to abide in it, remain, stay still. And in chapter 4, he tells Timothy to preach it. Now, right now, He's telling Timothy to hold on to it. Hold on to the pattern. Don't change the process. He said, don't change the blueprint from the word of God. He said, don't change the sound of doctrine, son. He says, he says, but someone may be asking right now, how do you determine what sound doctrine is? Okay. Well, I'm glad y'all asked y'all. Now, the word sound, look at that word sound. That word sound means healthy. So in other words, whenever we preaching and we teaching, we need to be giving the people of God a healthy diet. Yeah. 
And a healthy diet is the word of God. It's healthy. The sound doctrine is teaching that leads to genuine spiritual growth. And y'all, we all need spiritual growth. We all want to be spiritual, healthy. Now, some of us take vitamins for strength. Some of us take different pills to, to help us. But the word of God, that's healthy. But we got to make sure we have sound doctrine. And see, people need to grow in maturity in Christ. And people are growing maturity in Christ. And Paul says, you heard this from me. He says, I saw the risen Christ, and he entrusted me with this authority to build his church. Then Paul says, he says, Timothy, I'm not finished. He said, just holding on to sound doctrine is not enough. He said, you just can't hold on to the sound of doctrine, son. He said, you got to hold on to the sound of doctrine and the faith that is in Jesus Christ. He said, you must believe in what the Bible teaches. Then you must hold to sound doctrine and the love that is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, you got to know what you're teaching. Uh -huh. Teach the truth. Uh -huh. Then when you teach it, come from a place of love from Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. Don't say what you think, Timmy. Say what Jesus would say. Think the way Jesus would think. Act the way Jesus would act. He said, you must seek the highest good of the one love or love, and it had to be genuine and unconditional, son. But in closing, he tells Timothy, his word is again, that you are the guard of the deposit of sound doctrine. What is it that he's talking about? This deposit, you got to guard it. He's talking about the word of God. He said it doesn't matter if there's 30 people in the congregation that's false teaching. He said if you stand alone, you need to stand alone and preach the sad doctrine of Jesus Christ. Right. But he says, guess what? He said when you stand up and you're doing it the right way, he said the Holy Spirit is going to be in you and the Spirit is going to be speaking through you. He said it's the Holy Spirit living in us that allows it to be God. Okay? He said not only uh, does God's Spirit can enable us to keep the pattern of sound doctrine, he said we must continue to depend on the Holy Spirit. You remember when, when Jesus told the disciples in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, he said, be ye witnesses of me. He said, start at home in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. But before that, he said, I'm going to send you a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus was going back to his right hand place, which is the right hand of God. But he was going to send the Holy Spirit to come back to bring things back to their remembrance that he had taught them. And my brother and sister, the Holy Spirit will give you some things that's not even in the book. The Holy Spirit will give you some things that will make a man and woman say, hmm, where did he or she get that from? The Holy Spirit will protect you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. I'm a living witness, y'all. If you really depend on the Holy Spirit, you can be minding your own business. You can be at work. You can be in your living room. You can be in your car. The Spirit will drop something in your spirit to tell to the people of God. Amen. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Amen. Never shall forget, Brother Phillips know this because me and him would talk about it when he, when he used to work with me at Urban. A lot of times, I would be working and the Spirit would give me something. I'd say, I'm going to write it down later. And i go back and it's gone. Right. But what I've learned, I've learned to keep a little pad. And a pen, so when the Spirit give it to me, I write it down. Thank you, Lord. I keep that working. That's what the Holy Spirit does, my brothers and sisters. So in closing, let's 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 remember what Paul is telling his son in the ministry. Now Paul is in his sixties. Timothy is in his thirties. Timothy is timid. He's fearful. He's discouraged because affliction has taken place around there. Now Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus. But not only was he a pastor in Ephesus, he was an overseer of other churches in that Asian minor area. So this young man had a lot of responsibilities on his shoulders. He was overseeing other pastors in that area. So he had a lot of responsibilities. Then there was false teaching that came inside the church. So I said earlier, for those of you all who are here, and for those who may have came late who missed it, all of us need a Timothy, and we all need a Paul. So right now, do we have any questions? Hmm. Any questions? Feel, feel free. The, the floor is open right now. Any, any questions concerning uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 14? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, yes, ma'am.
Yes, ma'am. That, that's true too. That's true. Yes. Uh, on this, on all these calls, it was basically God telling us that it's a passing of the torch. That's right. It's a passing of the torch, but it's for all of us to believe because the recognition is for the believers. And all these calls are for the uh, believers in Christ Jesus to go out and be what Timothy and Paul had said to do. And he's charging us as believers to pass. The torch has been passed to us. And it's telling us that the power on us to do this now. And if we don't stand right. holy now, we lose. That's because right. we are the grandparents. Yes. We are the mothers and the fathers. And if we're not doing it right now, that the next generation is right. That's right. That's right. So the call, all these calls were for the believers in Christ Jesus yes. to carry the torch, to pass it on to the next generation of Jesus. And the second torch, the fire does not go Right. So, so I want to ask. I want. I want. I want to ask. Go ahead, brother. No, I just want to share with my God. A lot of times, when, you, when the Holy Spirit is with you, a lot of negativity can be going on around you. Mm-hmm. Well, people can be saying some things, and a lot of people at work are saying, "Uh, you need him, bro." But the Holy Spirit got it to where I don't even really hear something. Right. 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 When you with the Spirit, it's going to always be God. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. And, and, that's, and that's the key, brother. For you, uh, uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, you know, uh, the one thing the one thing that really saddens my heart is how I, I, I spoke to uh, pastors and preachers, uh, you know, just the local church uh, in general. Uh, it makes you question if the church has put the Holy Spirit on the back burner. Mm. What is the... Uh, Oh. It, you know, it, 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 it makes you wonder sometimes because certain things that takes place yeah. uh, inside the church. My brother and sister, this is not our church. Right. <laughs> right. This is God's church. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. You will get ran over if you keep getting in the way. This is God's church. No matter how long you grew up in the church, no matter how many family members you have, bro, no matter how much persuasion you try to do, you try to tell this person that it, this is God's church. Yeah. And if we keep getting away of God's church, you're going to eventually get ran over. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit. See, we in times right now, my brother says, God is not playing. Yeah. We need to be praying for each other. Man. We need to be motivating yeah. each other. We need to wrap our hands around each other. Because whatever happened, we all have a past. Amen. <laughs> we all have did some things. Some of us did some things on yesterday. Some of us woke up this morning on the wrong side. Our mind was on the wrong side. So what I'm saying, for us to really do what God wants us to do, we got to be on the same page. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy. He says, Timothy, keep the church the way God wanted to be. But you got to have the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and one thing that I learned from studying the Bible, there's going to always be evil that's always going to try to stop the plan of God. But if you notice it, Every time evil comes on the scene, God originally moved the evil from the scene. <laughs> so we got to make sure we're not a part of these evil tactics. So we got to make sure that we're all on the same page. That's the only, that's only way God's going to add to the church. Our knowledge is not going to add to the church. Different ideas we come up with is not going to add to the church. It's love, working together, and motivating and encouraging each other is what's going to grow this church. Not only this church, but every local church. You got some churches in Los Angeles that have shut down. You got pastors. I talk to preachers all the time who have stopped serving God because they became criticized by the members. People became so critical of them. Y'all, we got to wrap our arms around each other. <laughs> and say, you know what, brother and sister, I'm here for you. I love you. Is there's, there's someone else, brother Charles, don't go in.
Question the first, okay, uh, okay. Uh, the mean uh king had a code in the furnace. Okay, they said uh he told God, he said, God, uh look like there's four men tonight. They said, Thank you, three men. They said all of a sudden, oh yeah, God. <laughs> okay, they looked up. Three men above you said, Thank you, he said, uh, it was so hot when they opened up the furniture, it killed the dog. Today, when you leave here, I know this Super Bowl today is the Super Bowl, but encourage somebody. If it's a text message, tell them you love them, tell them to hang in there. Amen. Yeah. Let's go to the Lord for a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what our eyes have saw and what our ears have heard. We ask you, Lord, to take us on higher for our 10 a.m. service, Father. Bless the singing, bless the service, and bless the preacher who's going to present your word. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.